And now, the Living Mandela's legacy through women's empowerment. Please welcome our panelists to the stage. Good morning, all. My colleague, African leaders from right across Africa, all protocols observed. A pleasant good morning to you. I am Precious Annabelle Levy from the Lion Mountains of Sierra Leone, and I am a broadcast journalist and a gender specialist, and I act as a liaison between the government and the people with regards to women and girls empowerment. This year's Mandela Washington Summit is about to kick off with an all fired up panel that we'll be talking about leaving Mandela's legacy through the empowerment of women. Women's empowerment across the board have been of the essence in recent times and we have seen how history has showed us how Mandela stood up for women's inclusion in South Africa and how he moved the country's women's participation in all spheres of life from 2.7% to 27% when he was appointed, when he was elected as the democratic president of South Africa in 1994. He went further to declare a day to celebrate women on the 9th of August in 1996. And we could see that across Africa, we have been following the lead. We have Liberia having the first female president. In the person of Her Excellency Helen Johnson Sully, followed by Malawi, where we had Our Excellency Joyce Banda, and the list goes on. But it is a reality also that amidst the success stories that we have here, fellow leaders, women still strive for their voices to be heard, to break the glass ceiling. It is a reality. We battle with illiteracy, female genital mutilation. We battle with culture and tradition that women should be at the back, should complement the men, and so on. And here today, we have a pool of wealth of experienced leaders that are helping me to sail into a journey that will leave us all inspired to go back to our communities and be the change that we seek. fellow leaders. With us here this morning, we have Megan Ward, an entrepreneurial activist and founder of Feminology. You can please pass this on. Thank you, Precious. I am so excited to be here today in the room full of such young leaders. My name is Megan Ward. I'm a women's entrepreneurial activist. I speak on behalf of the platforms of women's empowerment and entrepreneurship. And I'm the founder of Femology, which is a boutique co-working space in Detroit. I founded it simply because I wanted women to connect in our community. My journey started out in college and from a simple aha moment of my mom losing her job. And so I was raised by a single mother and her losing her job, it really put fire under, underneath me to create my own economic opportunities. So I started to think of what I was great at and how I wanted to help the world. And so I knew that I was really great at business. And another thing that I was really great was connecting with women. So I really pursued connecting those two things, and I decided to pursue women's entrepreneurship. And so from that, I started creating a branding agency where I help women entrepreneurs build their brands from the bottom up. 
So I work with a lot of multicultural brands, such as Alakay Naturals and The Main Choice, where I spearhead their branding. And my purpose project, which is Femology, I spearhead Detroit's women's entrepreneurial revolution. And so I am so excited to be here. I think that what you all are doing is phenomenal. And I definitely, definitely connect on you all on your level because we both are young leaders and we want to make change in our community. So thank you, Precious. Thank you very much. And we <clears throat> see that moving passion into changing the world and ideas of people. Fellow leaders, next on the panel, we have Nice Nyalete Lengente, who is a 2016 Mandela Washington Fellow and has been championing the work against female genital mutilation or cutting through dialogue. And she was recently nominated for the 2018 Times Most Influential People. Thank you, and it's great to be here with these amazing young people from all over African countries. And I really want to start with my personal journey, why I started doing what I'm doing today, because I work with women and girls on the fight against female genital mutilation and child marriage. And I work for Amre South Africa under the Alternative Rights of Passage Project as their anti-FGM and child marriage global ambassador. When I was eight years old, I was supposed to undergo the cut. But I knew that if I be subjected to female genital mutilation, I'll not be able to be the woman that I wanted to be. I had seen girls undergo female genital mutilation. I had seen pain, I had seen death, and I've seen girls when their dreams are taken away, whereby they are, not be, they are not able to be the women that they wanted to be. My dream was to continue with my education and later help other girls, but it was not easy. I started having fights with my community because I ran away at the age of eight years. And I had to hide in a tree and stay there at 4 a.m. in the morning with my sister who was three years older than me. And the second time, uh, uh, we received greetings from our family members and uncles. And I remember when we were planning to escape again, my sister told me, nice, I'm so tired of the beatings, I cannot be running away. So she gave up and she said again, since you're two years older than me, Probably, if I sacrifice myself to undergo the cut, they will leave you. And she was not lucky. She got circumcised, and later she got married. And I think throughout my journey, she's one of the people who has really been inspiring me, because even if I could not save her, I could not be able to fight for her. It doesn't mean that I have to keep quiet. I still have other African girls all over the world, all over Africa, that I, they don't even understand that female circumcision is not really done, uh, is not supposed to be done. They don't really also know that they have a constitution that is protecting them. But then again, we have girls with disabilities who can walk, who cannot walk, who cannot see, where will they run to? So running away is not a solution. And that is why after I was saved my grandfather, I decided to come and start a community dialogue in my own community, whereby we started a community alternative rites of passage, which is a community driven approach whereby we are saying we still have the good part of our culture, that we need to retain it. We are not complaining that everything we are doing is bad. Let us embrace what is good and replace whatever is wrong, that is the cut with education, because without education, I don't think we can make any change. And for the seven years I've been working there with the Maasai community, we were able to save over 16,000 girls who are now women without the cut. <laughs> what a way to follow advocacy. Colleague fellows, meet Priscilla Mutembur, who is the Vice President of Cybersecurity Policy and Development at the US Africa Cybersecurity Group, and also advocates for women in agribusiness and smallholder farmers. Good morning, young leaders of Africa. It's such a pleasure and honor to be here. I'm really excited. Um, to be talking to you today. My journey, I am in cybersecurity. Yeah. I started off um, in, in computer systems engineering, but as I moved along, I went into agriculture, and I ended up working with women in agriculture, in, especially smallholder farmers. And that's where my passion for African smallholder farmers became, began. And it is a passion that has 
brought me to where I am. I am very passionate about trying to use technology in agriculture. Uh, for your own information, women in Africa represent 80% of the agriculture labor force. But they do all the work, but there is very little uh, that they get from it. And it is one of the things that I really would like us to focus on as, as African leaders to make sure that they get the benefit of the work that they do. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And finally, here with us is the only man among the women. <laughs> he is Herman Ramachandra. He is a global UN women he for she champion and has used his space as principal in Deloitte's consultancy to support women in technology initiatives to foster gender equality while he serve as a motivator to all, the, to all the men to be champions for women's issues across the board. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you for having all of us and uh, me. A uh, special shout out to the Notre Dame and Northwest and the Ali Fellows. <laughs> We'll hang out later on, right? So, um, so uh, very nice to introduce. Uh, I'm a uh, principal partner in Deloitte Consulting, um, focus on technology, spe uh, especially uh, what we call disruptive technology. But uh, that's my day job. My passion, and hopefully when I retire down the road, many, many, many years from now, is to uh, do what I'm doing today, but in a bigger way, give back. And why, why Africa? Um, because um, I grew up in West Africa and Nigeria. So most, most of my upbringing was in uh, Kaduna and Calabar. Before there was Abuja. So I, don't, I think one of the persons talking about Abuja, my dad was one of the original designers of Abuja as an engineer there. Uh, but anyway, I, um, so I had the opportunity about a few years ago to engage with the UN and uh, we helped complete. How, the idea was how do we connect with all the men and women around the world and boys and girls um, and in a digital fashion. So we, come, we built an online uh, website called empowerwomen.org. If you go out there, you can become a member and it's free. There's so many resources available to you, how to be an entrepreneur, how to engage with other people, how to engage globally, get mentors or be a coach for someone else. And that allowed me to uh, focus in Kenya. And um, I've gone to Kenya many times. And my primary focus in Kenya is to work in Nairobi with the, uh, in Kibera, teaching 21st century skills, and spend most of my time in the rural parts of Kenya, especially right now, lately, been in Niamir and Kisi, uh, working with the men, in, uh, especially the men there, because culturally, you know, like you said, women tend to take a, a back seat, or not tend to, but are forced to take a back seat. So I've done a lot of he for she events in, uh, in that location and also meeting with women who will to also teach me how to engage with the men and boys better and also to uh, work with them in looking at what their businesses and kind of work uh, together in coming up with better controls and qualities and all that. So doing a lot of that work, plus I have my day job and I have my family, but keeps me really busy. So have, thank you for having me. Hey, thank you very much. So I guess, fellas, we all see that we are ready. The boat is moving. And so we all will have the opportunity to send our questions to them, to make contributions um, one way as we go. And now to you, Megan. Yeah. Your work is peculiar, branding. There are different definitions of branding. But here, we would like to know what does empowerment, the empowerment of women mean in your space, specifically with regard to branding? Yes, no, that's a great question. So in regards to what I do in empowering women, it all boils down to what your purpose is, really your why on why you were set in, on this earth. And so when I'm working with women on a day-to-day -day basis, whether they want a career in corporate America or they want to be an entrepreneur, women want to be purposeful and impactful. They want, they want to be used, whether it's using your gifts or your skill set or, or something that was given to you. you. You want to be used. And so we're constantly working with women at Femology in terms of, okay, what are you great at? How can you use this tool, they use this as a tool in helping other people? And so for me, empowering women means finding your purpose, using that purpose to help other people. For me, when I, when I was back in college, when I started my journey, 
that was a challenge in itself because you have to take an innovative approach to pursuing your purpose. And through, through over time, mine has evolved. I know when I first started out in college, I wanted to be an engineer. And soon I realized that I didn't want to be an engineer. My mom wanted me to be an engineer. And so from that, I started asking myself, okay, what, what do I love? What am I passionate about? And so that's when, okay, you love connecting with women. Now, having a passion is great, right? But we, women also need to be economically empowered. So you take that passion aspect and you say, okay, how can I turn this passion into a profit? And so that's where branding came in for me. It allowed me to give people a tool in a way to perceive me. And so I started branding myself as a women's empowerment activist. And soon I was learning that people were kind of jumping on board. They were like, okay, if you're a women's empowerment activist, what do you do? How can you help people? And so, so yeah, it all boils back down to your purpose. How are you purposeful and how you're impactful? All right, thank you very much. Turning your passion into profit. And one thing I think I forgot to mention about Megan is that she was appointed as the speaker for the U.S. Embassy for Women has, and has bagged home lots and lots of awards for the work that she do. The only man among us. I'm accepted though, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the work, again, that you do, it's not common. We live in a patriarchal society, mostly in Africa, where women are supposed to support. Empowerment is key for you. How do you do it? What does it mean to you in your space? So great question. So first of all, I'll just say this, that I would not be where I am in my career if I didn't have the right people to support me and make me look good, right? And the people that make me look good are not just the men that make me successful and make our group successful, but it's the women. So it's a combination of men and women, a combination of all the youth and uh, everyone out there. Um, but more importantly, um, I, you know, um, actually I was given a challenge by someone in my office a few years ago. Is I talk a lot about um, equality in the, in the workplace, but talking is not enough. So I said, okay, let's just action on that. And that's, that's what led to this kind of... Um, uh, movement that we have together. Uh, so for me, um, you know, to, to go back to Africa, um, it, it's so when I went when I started doing this, um, I realized that you have to engage with the uh, with the men and and the uh, young boys actually too very early on. Um, so for example, with the boys, I uh, and, and by the way, because of my work. Uh, it's not very easy to start your own nonprofit and all right now. So what I do is I partner with different organizations that are looking for uh, individuals like me to come in and do, do the kind of work. So for example, Asante Africa, which focuses on Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya. So we teach the young boys and girls um, how to engage, how to ensure that each person is treated equally. And then with the men, which is a more difficult task, is um, we have these he for she events we hold. And uh, we, we, you know, we get no more than 50 to 60 men together and have an open dialogue about what it is to uh, engage, right? It always starts off the meeting with the men saying, yes, I have uh, four sons and one daughter, or I have five daughters, but I finally got one son. Um, and, uh, and then we talk about how the sons are important to educate and not the girls. So we change that dialogue over a period of two to three hours into what if your daughter has this happened to her in a negative way? How would you feel about that, right? And the men engage more and more, and then they make their own he for she pledges, just like we were making the men, Nelson Mandela pledge here. We have, we ask uh, the men to make their pledges, and uh, we have a WhatsApp group. We check on each other every once in a while, we share, and in WhatsApp, and, then, and the men have engaged really well in the WhatsApp group in telling us what they're doing in their community and all that. So it's, it's engaging in a very, um, in, in a cultural way, in person to person, but using technology also to continue that dialogue. Yeah, because I want to say, what a way of engaging these people, as well as changing the stereotype of society, having more women included in our different space. Our 2016 Mandela Washington Fellow, you are doing a 
fabulous job. And female genital mutilation is one I believe touches each and every one of us directly or indirectly. And it has been a debate of total eradication of FGM or the age of consent. In all of this, women play a pivotal role in the empowerment, having their voices. What does empowerment mean in what you do? Thank you. So I think to me, when we talk on issues of female genital mutilation, whether it's a 12-year-old girl, it's an 18-year-old girl, this is a violation of human rights. Uh, I mean, the long-term effects that a 12-year girl experiences, also an adult or an 18 or a 20 years uh, old will experience. And to me, I think uh, women empowerment refers to increasing and improving social, economic, and political legal strength on women uh, uh, to ensure that we have equal opportunities. Because in the communities, some of us are coming, remember that uh, women or girls don't have equal opportunities with boys. There are, uh, there are roles that they are believed that this is only for boys, but women are not allowed to do that. But throughout my work, uh, we've been really trying to find small networks of the girls. We train younger girls from the age of 12 years uh, to 17 years on leadership skills, on entrepreneurial skills, because we don't want the girls to wait until they are 20 years, until they are 30 years. That's now when they are training, uh, you know, to say this is what as a girl I would want to do. But that said, uh, we don't just talk to girls. We also talk to boys, because the younger boys in future will be the husbands of these girls. They really need to agree that women need spaces. These girls need to be given the space to go and do whatever they want to do. And I believe in any work we are doing, or any, uh, may it be a very sensitive cultural issue or anything that we are working on, I think women empowerment is key. We cannot really address other problems that we have, with, which we think are problems in Africa, if we are really not uh, supporting our women to be able to, uh, to continue with whatever they want to do. Okay, and so we see that in order for these women to know that FGM is wrong, whether at the age of consent, they must know, they must be on the know, they must keep listening to you and also community leaders because no one person can make the change. It's gonna take a team. And so your dialogue, as I said into earlier, has been a powerful tool in trying to minimize or eradicate female genital mutilation and or cutting across the board. Madam Vesilia, you work with women, the grassroots. Many a time when we talk about empowered women, we think that they are those that have darkened the walls of the classroom or colleges. You work in local communities, you go down to that level. What does empowerment mean at your level, dealing with those women? That is a very good question. To me, women empowerment <coughs> is about creating that environment and providing the resources for women, especially at that grassroots level, to be able to, to know who they are, they are, their womanhood, their talent, their capabilities, and then being able to use those to change their own lives first and then the lives of, the, of others. Because you find that in those communities, it is the women who are doing everything. We we'll look after the children. We we'll even have got to have income to send those children to school. But yet, they don't even have the resources. In some cases, they don't even own anything. Everything belongs to the husband or to the male uh, counterparts, to the extent that in some cases, it's even the son who ends up having the ownership of whatever the women are working on. And it is all about that, because it is women who are the change agents. It is women who are the, uh, they, they are the ones who are actually raising the economy in those areas. So they need to be empowered. So it is about getting those women access to the right resources, which they don't have access to. 
Yeah, and we see many a time that women are mostly breadwinners in their respective communities, but yet they tend to be at the back. They tend to be submissive because society and culture has made us so. So, fellow leaders, the floor is all yours now. You can channel in your comments, contributions, questions to my fabulous panelists here, and they will be more than welcome to give the appropriate answers. And so I would like us to go through it in a systematic way where we, the first set of questions, we're gonna have four, and it's gonna be one representative from um, my far left to the middle here, and then my far right. And how I want us to do it, we want to have gender balance. So if we can have two men and women, he or she, at the front, at the back, in the middle, whichever way is comfortable with you all. The floor is all yours. So while we're waiting for someone to come, I'd like to add something, because Priscilla is spot on about uh, you know, how, what empower means. And, and it's funny because empowerment means different things to many people. Okay. So, and, um, so one of the things I feel that is very, very important is this is generational gap, right? So I remember this time when I was, um, at one time I was in this village um, in, in, um, in Nima, it's called Bukhera. And all the, most of the women there are either widows or the husbands have left them. But the land they stay on is not necessarily theirs because mm -hmm. that husband can come back anytime and come and take it away from them and there's nothing protecting them from those land rights, right? Um, so these women have set up their own uh, merry-go-round, uh, like you know, uh, how to share money with each other and set up their own businesses. Um, but the interesting thing about the empowerment part is that they have an amazing idea, but they just need this, the mechanism to produce a quality product of that idea, out of that idea. So one of the things that we do on the empowerment side is is how to teach them financial literacy on bookkeeping, simple things of bookkeeping. Mm -hmm. What is the total cost of ownership of the product you buy to build your end product? Mm -hmm. That transportation cost to go buy that product, that thing you needed, should be counted in, and they don't count that in sometimes. So just simple things of bookkeeping, quality control processes, making sure that the product you wanna sell, at the end product, is actually meets the standards that are expected. So anyway, I just wanna add that, because uh, so that's part of the empowerment part, which is those key educational steps that you take. Yeah, building their skills. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Raman. And, and to add to what Raman just said, education is not about getting into the classroom. Yes. Because I found that a lot of those women are so educated, they know more than what all of us know. We have been into so many classrooms. Okay. It's about tapping into that education and giving them the courage to use that education and in a manner that can then help all of us because they change our lives. Okay, yep. thank you very much indeed. So at the far left there, yes ma'am. Um, good morning ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mam Kordenyai, I'm from Senegal. And I, um, I was at the University of Delaware in Ooh. civic leadership. So I'm particularly happy today to be part of this panelist. And the reason why is that I, I'm, I, really ha I'm, I was really happy to see a man in, in the panel because when we talk about women, when we talk about empowering women, most of the time people think that it is just about women and they're not including the man. So today I would like to ask to all the people here and particularly the man that is sitting there also to kind of do some workshop or some activities, any kind of thing that would say that this is not only about women, this fight include both men and women. So my question is for, for our gentleman here, th there, I would just like to ask him, what kind of activities do you think, or what kind of lesson do you think that you should take to say that this fight is for both men and women and not only about women? Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, could we have the mic here, somewhere in the middle? We'll get back over there, we'll get back to you. Can we have one in the middle of here? We'll come back. Okay, uh, good morning, fellows, and uh, thanks to the panelists. Mm -hmm. 
I am John Alexander Young Jr. I'm from Liberia. I'm from Liberia, and I work in the field of community health, research, and livelihood. Uh, as a Liberian, uh, the issue of women empowerment is very important to us because we felt the impact of a female leadership who was President Ellie Johnson Sally. She set the bar so hard, not only in Liberia, for female inclusion in government. Uh, but we realized that working with women, there is a high deficit of skills. Like, for example, if you want to employ a lady based on basic computer skills, they lack that. And you talk about women in agriculture. So I'm so concerned, what are you doing at the grassroots level to <coughs> empower women in terms of meeting uh, contemporary or uh, technological skills to ensure that they can compete with guys at the grassroots level. Thank you. And right over here, right at the back, at the back, yes, please, thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Julistiza Mengiseni, and I am from Tanzania. I thank you so much, the panelists, for a wonderful discussion that you have been having. And uh, I'm really happy about what you're doing. Right here in the room, there are a lot of women who are really doing good things and trying to make change and impact in their communities. But I would like to ask my mother, who is really specialized in the cyber crime. It comes to a point that when you are a woman, it, uh, you have to choose between your family, or I can say your marriage, and the career that you really want to pursue. In an African setting, we have, a chan we have chances that uh, you're not really going to reach your career or to reach your, the impact to the society just because you don't know how to like, divide yourself and what you really want to do. So I want to ask you, what did you go through? What barriers did you break for you to become who you are so that we can take it back as a lesson and as an inspiration for us when we want to make impact to the community? As a matter of uh, us being present, making good family, creating uh, uh, healthy <coughs> relationships, and at the same time, making the impact in the society that we're living. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we have the second row, the gentleman. Thank you very much. My name is Jasper Sembi. I am from um, Georgia State University, and I'm <laughs> public management track. I am originally from Sierra Leone. Um, thank you. It has been shown over and over again um, that the most potent method or means of alleviating poverty is the empowerment of women. It has worked in Bolivia. It has worked in Bangladesh. It has been shown by um, Amatya Sen to work in India, and we know it works. If you give women contraceptives, you give them control over the cycle of birth, you give them microfinance, you give them a bit of education, and you throw in some seeds for farming, the floor will rise. I would like the panel to please emphasize on the fact that women are being subjected to the animalistic cycle of giving birth, they are being suppressed across the African nations, and we need our governments, our policymakers need to emphasize that they provide for them education and we promote family planning. It's very important that we promote family planning because our culture suppresses women and we are forgetting to focus on this. Please and emphasize on this that as young leaders, we empower women. This is the only way to alleviate poverty in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. It seems as if we're having a hot room, so we will go around for a second round, but let's allow the panelists to please respond to the questions that have been posed to them. Okay. So uh, I've got two questions that I would like to respond to. 
Uh, first of all, I would like <coughs> to start off with the um, question raised by the gentleman in the middle column. How do we get women to have the same um, level of uh, skill, skill, skill set? It's, it's enlightenment on the ones who provide the resources to make sure that the resources get to the women. Because you find that the reason why women don't have the right skill set is because they have not been given the opportunity to acquire those skill set. Because they have been passed on. Because uh, when you go to the villages, boy children have been sent to school instead of girl children. So as a <clears> result, they have not been given the opportunity to get those skill set. So we have to change that mindset and make sure that equality as far as education, as far as obtaining skills, and, and as far as resources. You find that even sometimes when resources are provided at village level, uh, they're only given to male people because they are the ones with the national ID, identification because women don't have. And for you to be able to get some fertilizer or some seeds, you have to produce your identification. Women don't have that. So we need to make sure that we get everybody to be seen as an equal and be given the same opportunity for, for whatever that is available. On the second question, uh, the one about being able to, to have a career, it, you have to have a support structure within the family. And it's all about education. And, 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 and to me, it's all about empowerment. If we allow our women to be empowered, then they will be able to do whatever they are capable of doing. I've been very fortunate that I, I come from a family, right from my father, who, who right from the beginning made sure that all his children were educated to, to the same level, depending on your abilities. So I was fortunate in, in that respect. And then I had a good support structure. And us as women, we also have got to support each other. That is very helpful, especially in growing. Let's forget about this Queen Bee syndrome. Let's make sure that we support each other and we acknowledge each other and we help each other. And let's mentor each other as women. Yeah. That, that is very useful. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And to you, Raman. So I think the question was around uh, role, uh, role playing and all, uh, or uh, how do we make sure that we, what kind of activities we have. I mean, uh, let, me, let me change the thing. I think they're like, when I, when I spend some time with the Notre Dame and uh, Northwestern uh, Yali Fellows, and uh, in the past years, I've been doing it for the last, uh, I think, four or five years now, um, we focus on what are the different trends that are happening around the world, but specifically on the impact of Africa. And to me, if you understand what the trends are and what the impact is, then you'll be able to play the appropriate role in making things happen, and, uh, and each of you have a role to play. So one of the things I believe in is that you all here, all of you, are the building blocks for the future generation that is going to take the bright continent that Africa is and make it brighter, right? Um, so some of the trends I want to talk about real quickly, <clears throat> the idea of <clears throat> demographic change. We know that Africa by 2050 is going to be the most populous continent out there, right? We know that. But majority of that population is going to be the youth, right? So how do you get a process started now in getting ready for the youth? You're the youth today, but it's your children and other people's children are going to be the youth of the future. So that, you, know, you have that responsibility as the the future leaders to make that happen. The second trend is um, on uh, the how the cities are going to get bigger and bigger. It is a proven fact that uh, cities like Lagos and Nairobi and others are, be are becoming bigger and bigger, and they're going to continue to grow. And they're going to become these mega cities. How do you plan around that? Because you're going to take people away from the rural parts of the country now, which is, all, which is what happened in China, right? If you think about China and the migration, the, the migrants going all to all the cities basically because they need to make money, right? So how do you plan around that kind of activity? The third thing is the economic power shift that's happening. We know that for the last 2,000 plus years, it's been controlled by the Western war, uh, countries. It's no longer that way. It's going to be controlled by the Eastern and Africa, uh, all the countries in Africa. So that, that economic shift is very, very critical. So how are you going to adopt to that? 
And then, is, uh, and then the, the challenges that Africa has is the climate change and resource scarcity. So you, the interesting thing about Africa is it's got tons of resources, but most of the resources don't stay within the continent, they leave the continent, right? So how do you take advantage of those resources? And then the climate change is happening that will continue to happen. How do you allow, plan for something like that? And the last thing that's gonna make all this work or allow you to be successful is technology. What are all the different technologies, you know, this agri-tech that's happening that Priscilla mentioned all. So my, 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 my response to the question is, if you understand the trends for the next 10 years, 15, 20 years, how do you adopt today and plan for that? I, I truly believe that that will set the right uh, platform for all of you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And to you, Megan. So I believe it was this question from the third section. Yeah. It really resonated with me. So most of you are millennials in the room. And while us millennials, we didn't create the blueprint of life, but we've really revolutionized the blueprint of life. And so we're starting to understand that, okay, I can do things a little bit differently. I can be this kind of leader. I don't have to be in this box. Something that I think we, that we lack is self-care. So we can be ambitious, we can have all these different types of goals, but how are we filling our cup up as leaders? And that's something that I personally, I've challenged, I've, yeah, it's been extremely challenging. Um, I'm, I'm a wife, I'm a mom, I'm a mentor, I have three different businesses, but at the same time, I need to be filling my cup up as well. So, so something, and, and this is kind of like my secret sauce, and I, I always think about it or I'll write it down. So the number one thing is understanding not only your business vision, but your personal vision for how you see your life. What are your values? Is family a value? Is spirituality a value? Is giving back to the community a value? Think about those things. And so rather it being work-life balance, work-life harmony, how can your life and your purpose interact seamlessly with each other. I know for me, I wanted to travel, but I also want, really wanted to be a mom. And I really didn't want to give up my career and, and have a baby, I wanted to do both. And so we're understanding that, hey, we can do this, but how do we maneuver in this? And so the second thing is, aside from your values and your vision is cultivating your life ambassadors, something that has been monumental for me. And Life ambassadors, these are people who are supporting you in your highest being. And I'm not talking about best friends, I'm not talking about people that you grew up with, but I'm talking about those people that not only support you where you are now, whether it's your success or who you are as a person, but they're supporting your future self, so that you 10 years from now. The last thing that has helped me is cultivating mentors. So I call them my board of mentors. And so I personally interview, interview people who I want to be my mentors. And so your mentors, these are people who are not only transparently sharing their opportunities with you, their wins and their challenges, but they're supporting you in different aspects of your life. And when it, when it comes to mentors for me, I know I need personal mentors and I need business mentors. So I need to see women who are moms, who, are, who have businesses, who are juggling multiple things, and I also need professional mentors that can elevate me in business, to, that can get me to the next step so I can impact more people. Okay, and just to add on to that, maybe you want to clarify to us, most times when we talk about mentors among young people, what you hear about, they want the famous names, they want the influential people, the people with the money, so if you're looking for a mentor, what are some of the characteristics that are keen to find in one? Right, so that's something that I really focus at Femology is like, okay, who are your board of mentors? And a lot of women, we, we don't know where to start when it comes, even men, we don't know where to start. So I started to get very specific in what I was looking for. Um, I, I knew I needed a man who, who was in corporate America, who was, you know, who had been, in the game for at least 10 to 20 years who could kind of teach me the ropes because I had never been in corporate America and I really need to learn structure and processes. So get really specific on, on what you want and what you need. And so, it, yeah, it, it can seem really glitz and glammy to say, okay, I want someone really famous or I want someone who has a larger following. Those, 
those are great, but a lot of times we don't need that. A lot of times we need to see someone at our level or who has been through something that we may experience one day. And my mentors, honestly, the mentors that I have today, they wouldn't have been my mentors two years ago because I wouldn't have been ready. So also appreciate where you are right now. And if you, if you want mentors that aren't kind of coming to you at this moment, get ready, be prepared. I know for me, I keep a, I keep a, a document on hand. So like when I'm, when I'm connecting with people on LinkedIn, I'm like, okay, they could be a potential mentor. Maybe we can meet for lunch. And so I'll send them a little bit more about myself just so they have like a document and it doesn't look like I'm an amateur. So it shows that I'm, I'm serious about what I do, I'm ready and I'm willing to, to commit, make a commitment with a high level mentor. Okay, and nice in response to Jasper's question. I feel um, you should because um, it does um, around what you do and also women birth complications and, or, and the empowerment of themselves, finding their strength. I think what he was uh, saying it's important and just going to also back to uh, someone who had just asked a question what we are doing also to the grassroots women because I work with grassroots women and when we also talk on issues of women empowerment we, we don't just think of women who are graduates who are professions and all that we also have these women who are voiceless because of any form of gender-based violence they have undergone they think that uh, you know there are people who can do it, you know, there are people who cannot be anything in life. So it's also about, uh, again, building their confidence. It's about uh, also uh, them knowing about their dig dignity and all that. And what we have been able to do, uh, mostly, especially to traditional birth attendants, because remember, they are paid to circumcise girls. That's their job. So as much as sometimes you are talking to people, giving them information on all forms of sexual and reproductive health and rights issues, but you're not telling them, what do we, I, I mean, what else can you do? They will ask you, that's my job. You know, uh, I'm paid $10 to circumcise one guy. So if I leave that, what should I be, uh, do? So it's then about, again, not just giving out information, but giving these women resources to be able to start income generating activities in a small way that they can do. Because again, that's the only way they can go back home and probably also raise their voices and tell people that this is, you know, it brings respect and all that. And it's not just uh, 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 about, uh, uh, it's not just, um, you know, about any form of sexual and gender-based violence. But when we talk of issues of family planning again, uh, remember again, it's another important issue for women to be able to decide on what they want to do with their own bodies, the right to whom and when to, you know, the right to whom and when to marry. These are really important issues again on empowerment that when we talk on empowerment, we sometimes forget. We just think about resources and all that. And uh, an example, uh, another example probably from my community, you see again, uh, we don't again have friendly policies whereby women are allowed on political positions. Remember, this is the place whereby women can go and bargain. This is the place whereby they can also go and ask resources to be able to support other women on grassroots level. So I think as much as we are doing different in, uh, interventions, but it's also important to encourage women to be on this political position. Like for us now in my community, for the first time we were able to have an, elect, an elected member of parliament who is a woman, uh, Honorable Peris Tobiko, which is not easy. You know, men, uh, supporting a woman to be in political space is not easy. But then again, these are great achievements whereby we can sit down and, uh, and, and discuss about them and they are really helpful in a way. Because women can go to that lady who has been elected and that lady will be able to pass whatever information they want in parliament and all that. Yeah, and gathering from all what you have said is one, we need a level playing ground. I believe we should not segregate who should do what. Create the level playing ground, let them go and prove themselves. And so if society, if we can change the stereotypes in society, it will be better for us. And then as leaders, let's use our space. Like for me, I do on Facebook a live program called Moments with Precious, where I talk on different issues that have to do with women, girl, child, youth, empowerment, and all. And I believe, just like we were told here, Yali didn't make us leaders. 
we are all leaders and so we're just complementing each other's efforts and that's one thing we need to continue <coughs> in that trend and then when you talked about traditional bath attendance you are so right because there was a time in Sierra Leone where government wanted to reduce the um, maternal mortality rates right and one way they did was to give subventions to these traditional birth attendants so instead of them helping those women to give birth they are given monthly stipends so at the end of the day when a woman approaches you because many traditional women believe in these um, um, traditional birth attendants they don't believe to go to the hospital so it is incumbent on them when they are given the subventions for them to now take those women to the nearest um, big hospital that they have so that we reduce the mortality rate. So we have a next set of questions again. Okay, we'll come to you. So we'll go, we'll go right to our left. Uh, good morning. My name is Varna Joseph. I'm from South Sudan. i um, been in Drexel University doing civic leadership. Um, well, I want to ask a question about the girls or women's circumstances. It's an issue. First of all, it's a very unique kind of activities that you're doing, and I really love it so much because n so far since I joined activism, I've never heard somebody speaking about that. Um, but what do you think about working with other young women from Sudan. I was born and raised in Sudan, and I saw how circumstances has destroyed many young um, girls or women or ladies in Sudan, and it has affected their future even in giving birth and other, um, other issues. So what do you think? Have you thought of working with other women from Sudan? I'm speaking about Sudan because I've been there and I saw how effective that was. So think about it. Okay, and a lady has been having her hands up with the heart in the middle. Just where the lady from Sudan, in the middle, yes. Yeah, actually. Um, yeah, my name is Bridget um, from Ghana. Um, my question is to the cybersecurity experts. And what I want to know is uh, criminals are always a step ahead of us. And I want to know what new crimes have you identified, the modus operandi they're using, and how we can stay safe online. Because online banking, online transactions generally are not uh, super you know, welcome in our countries. In Ghana, romance fraud is very high. What new crimes have you identified? Thank you very much. And, and this row we have a lady at the front and one at the back. So we'll take two. It's over here. Yes, the, she's here. <coughs> Hello, my name is Jatube Aziaka. I'm from Togo, West Africa. And uh, I'm representative of uh, Africa for United Nations to combat desertification. Uh, convention, uh, convention to combat the desertification. My question is about access of women to land and uh, land rights. Mm. And I'm very happy we have uh, one of our sister who work in uh, in agriculture uh, agriculture field. I'm from Drake University. <laughs> okay, I want to know uh, during her work. Uh, did you go through or come across about this big challenge mm -hmm. in our countries? Because nowadays it's a very big challenge. In the rural area, still the women don't have access to land. But in agriculture, we know that the women play a big role. Mm -hmm. And we need to have access to the land. Mm -hmm. Land is our mother. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And right at the back, we have a gentleman. No, let's give him. Yes, please. Hi. Thank you very much. I'm James Amuksi from Ghana. I was at the Mecca, Howard University, for public management. Please, 
Who is an empowered woman? Does the African woman need to change her skin to feel empowered? Because there is a trend currently ongoing in Africa where the young ladies are trying to change their skin. Is this a new form of empowerment? Thank you. Okay, and right over here, the lady screaming. Yes, the one over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. My name is Danai Chirao from Zimbabwe, and I have two, que two questions. The first question goes to the panelists who talked about Queen Bee Syndrome. Right? Don't you think that the way you brand women and talk about women is problematic as an activist if you say things like Queen Bee Syndrome as if women are not doing things to empower each other? That's my first question. The second question is for the gentleman. Do you think that male presence in female activism detracts from the women issue? because it's easier for men to accept another man's opinion when it comes to what women should be or shouldn't be. Okay. If, sorry, if the answer is yes, so do you think that the women's movement should be led by men? Thank you. Just the next, the next girl, yes. She, yes, the, two, the one with the two hands up. The lady with the two hands up here, in the middle here. Could you please stand up? The lady, yes, please. <coughs> yes. It, uh, she, hi, uh, my name is KV from Namibia, uh, representing uh, the University of Notre Dame. Um, if we are talking about women empowerment, it probably means that the men are holding on to the power and they don't want to give it up. Mm. And to me, mm. it sounds similar to how white people acknowledge white privilege, but they don't want to give it up. Mm. What are the practical steps that men can do to share this power to, mm. for equal empowerment? Mm. Thank you. Okay. The, so we have the gentleman in front, first row. Hello, um, I'm Yohane Kadama from Malawi, representing Georgia State University. Coming from Africa, I think we can appreciate the cultural norms where we have held our men on top for so long. And we are trying to break from that, which is very commendable, and I'm very much in support of that. The, the only question I'm having now is the drive which we have had just in little years in trying to get women on top and to empower them, which is very commendable. But it's now starting to backfire towards the same society which we are trying to improve. What do I mean by this? Uh, most men are not ready to handle empowered women. And this question I asked it, I think, uh, last week when we had the similar discussion at GSU. From this panel, from this panel, especially uh, the uh, uh, champion of he for she campaign, what are we doing to empower men so that they can handle an empowered woman? To avoid, <laughs> to avoid something which we are seeing familiar, that women who are empowered, most men are not able to handle them. And I've seen many women being uh, not able to have even marriages simply because men are walking out of their relationship. So how are we doing to empower men to handle an empowered woman? Thank you. Okay, and the lady standing over there seems to see if the room is hot this morning. Um, my name is Gloria from Uganda and from Wagna <laughs> and from New York. Um, my question is to the cyber expert. Um, in my country, there's a lot of online violence against women that's going on. And I've seen that in Rwanda as well, when um, naked pictures 
of a, a female presidential aspirant were leaked. And that happens in my country. For so many women that are climbing the ladders, they bring out information or naked pictures of them to discredit their work. So my question is, what are the most important strategies in addressing online violence against women? Thank you. Thank you very much. So it seems as if we have <coughs> interesting questions here for you all. So who would like to take the lead? So maybe just to uh, add on the lady from Sudan that what we are doing now, uh, we are able to, uh, just a few months ago, we were able to launch a Pan-African movement to end female genital mutilation. Uh, we've started with Kenya in three uh, different communities, and now we are in Tanzania also, but <coughs> we are planning to scale up and reach other countries. Because issues of female genital mutilation, as I can tell you, it's something that has been there for 200 years, over 200 years. So you need patience. It's not something that you just get into a community and start working on it. That means you really need to invest more in research to understand the myths and reason behind female genital mutilation. Because the alternative we are using in the community that I'm coming from, it does not or cannot work in another community in Sudan or cannot work in another community in Tanzania or even Senegal. And that said, it's because of the different reasons. For us, it's a rite of passage from girlhood to womanhood. To the Muslim community, it's for purity. Other people, it's for hygiene. So you need a solution that really relates with the community. And you need a culturally accepted solution again. We don't want the community to feel like we are taking their culture away. We are bringing something that is not impactful or something that they are not comfortable with. So our work mainly is to raise awareness, to talk to them and tell them the dangers of female genital mutilation, all forms of sexual and reproductive health and rights, what it means to take girls and boys to school, because we are not just fighting about the girl child. As he said, it's another big worry whereby we empower a girl child more who will be able you know, to take care or to marry this empowered girl and all that. So we are also sensitive on these things, on these issues. We are trying to make sure that we have boys' programs the same way we are having girls' programs. Okay, and Megan? So there was a question about Queen Bee Syndrome, and that relates to alpha women, women who are leading in their lanes, leading in their fields and their <coughs> careers. And so something that we've done on the grassroots level is create campaigns featuring powerful women. And so back, back at home in Detroit, Michigan, we cultivated a campaign called The Powerful Women, where we featured the most notable women, women of color to be specific, in a campaign. And we got them at a round table to talk about different challenges, discussions about how we can help one another. And I think that's something that society has done a great job at. And they've done a great job at really creating this mindset centered around that there can only be one woman. And so that's what I think is our job. Our job is to shift that perspective of how we see another woman who's in a power of position, how we, we both can work together to level up one another. Mm. So as an activist, as a, a woman who helps other women spearhead their branding, I'm telling them, okay, this is your purpose and this is her purpose. And this is how you both can work together to create change. And so that's our job as leaders. We are shifting mindsets. And when you shift mindsets, that starts with self. That's a great point. Yeah. OK, so I think there were a few questions addressed to me. So let me, um, let me put it this way first, OK? Um, a lot of the questions were, how do we uh, make sure that the men understand that having uh, women having equal rights is important? Uh, it's going to take some time because the current generation of men, they are men who will not change their minds because of the way they're cultivated themselves. Uh, I'm going to put one statistic in front of you, and it's, it's actually a scientifically proven statistic so that you know what to do when you go back. The age when a girl starts feeling lesser than a boy is at the age of four to five. And why that is the case is because of the way the household things are done and the way that the teachers in the schools separate the boys and girls in activities. So already the girl has, is starting to think, around the four, four to five years old, no more than six, that to go and um, kick a soccer ball or football is a boy's job, or a boy assembling things is meant for boys only. I need to go cook, or I need to play with dolls and all. So my challenge to you is, 
is to create a to create a gender equal society, but to start that early in life. So it's going to take some time to get to that point, right? So so that's something to keep in mind. And, and I'm happy to share that article that has been uh, that's out there with whoever the the Rx person is. I can share it with you because that is something that you need to add to your uh, your, your um, plans and how you expand your uh, entrepreneurship and your uh, work you do for your communities. The other thing is, uh, there was a question that was asked on, does a man's presence detract from a women movement? It could, but I would argue that uh, someone like myself who identifies as a feminist and believes that I, uh, that I can be successful, right, thank you, that I, that I can be successful not just because I have men around me or because of myself, but I can be successful in a combination of the uh, men and women and cultural diversity and uh, race diversity, okay? So that's very, very important for me and my group. Like my boss right now is a woman and, and I have absolutely zero ch issues with that. Why? Because of the way I've cultivated myself. Did I start off that way? No, I didn't, I grew up in, I grew up in Nigeria seeing how things are done. My own house, you know, it's an Indian house in Nigeria where my mom was the one who never worked. She always cooked. And also, I had to cultivate myself over a period of time and change that. And it's a combination of a few things. It's having, you know, by the way, all of you are the most intelligent people in the room, okay? I, and I, I use that example when I talked to the other Yalis a few, months, a few weeks ago. Your IQ is significantly high. Everyone in this room has significantly high IQ. There's no denying that. But ask yourself whether you have the right level of emotional quotient and the right level of cultural quotient. And as emotional quotient is, am I empathetic enough that I'm going to understand that if my business is not doing well because of diver lack of diversity, and do I have the right cultural quotient? Thank you. All right, thank you. I love that tap. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm going to answer the, one, the, the question on access to land first. It is a big problem. Uh, women do not have the same access to land as men. And this is all about changing their laws in, in, in many countries so that women have got the same rights to land as men. And that I think, when it comes to Africa, that is something that a lot of African government has got to do. It has got a lot to do with the legislation. And it's something that us as women, we have got to fight for. Um, the question on, questions on cyber security, uh, I think I can take those outside because I, I, would, I think it would take quite a lot to, to talk about what, what's there. But just to answer the issue on, on violence, online violence, that also has got to do with, a lot to do with policies and the regulations in the country. In Africa at the moment, that's some, an area where we are lagging behind. A lot of countries do not have cyber security policies and cyber security legislation, which would take care of, of, of a lot of the, those things that are already, that are currently happening. So, but we can talk about that in more detail. Yeah, thank you very much. And so we're running out of time, but you have the opportunity to chat with them after this program. So in conclusion, this is for each and every one of you. I would like to know with 700 young leaders in this room, what do you think should be our role in leaving Mandela's legacy through the empowerment of women? And if you could please make a Mandela pledge to us all so we hold you accountable wherever we are in the world in just one minute or one and a half minute. Thank you. Start with you, Nice. Thank you. So Mandela believed that young people can bring meaningful change to their communities through servant leadership. Young people should identify challenges in their own communities and work and creating solutions rather than waiting for donors or governments to do it. Because we are creative, we are brilliant, we are powerful, we are young, and we hold these brief dreams within ourselves to better our communities and to better our beautiful continent. And my pledge is to raise my voice through structured community dialogues to bring female genital mutilation and child marriage to an end by 2030. Thank you. Megan? Yes, so I want my Mandela, first, 
Mandela legacy, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, so I think that all collectively, we need to be catapulting ourselves and other, be other people into our highest being, whether that's personally or professionally, because they're so integrated. So my personal mission is to be a global ambassador for women's empowerment and to really define what women's empowerment is globally, because I've, as I've traveled to different countries, it means different things. And so that's fine if it means different things, but I think collectively, all countries, all over the world, we need to understand what this means for us all. And so personally, at the grassroots level, because I think that's so important, so locally, is creating more women with economic mm -hmm. opportunities. And as they create more economic opportunities, create an ecosystem where we can get funding which is a huge issue right now. Women, they're, they're having troubles with access to capital. So without access to capital, we can't grow, we can't scale. So we're operating at very low levels right now. And of course, on the global scale is creating a virtual mentorship where anybody in the world, no matter how much money you make, can have access to mentorship. All right, thank you very much. And so very quick. Um, I'm probably the, I am the oldest person in this panel, so I, I lived as a kid during apartheid and uh, watched and learned and watched what Mandela did on TV live, Madiba, right? And so my, my that's, that, that is the influence he's had in my life and me personally experiencing the kinds of racism that was there in South Africa, I've experienced it in my life here in the US. Um, and then my pledge is very simple. Every year I, when I talk to the Ali fellows, I tell them I'm always available to you. Um, and uh, my, my, my availability is there. I, I will make the time as a mentor, a coach, or someone I can learn from you also. For example, next week, there's an amazing group of six girls from Nigeria coming here for Technovation 20, 2018. It's a 2017 Yali Fellow leading that group, and I'm going to spend time with them next week in uh, California. So my pledge is I'm available to you all, okay? All right, thank you very much. And finally? Yeah. Uh, to, to me, Nelson Mandela's legacy is about uh, empowerment since it promotes seven leadership, equality, and, and standing for justice. And this, this all promotes women empowerment. And my pledge is to continue working with female rural farmers so that they have got access to land and access to resources. And I, I'm, I'm in the process of starting a program in, in Zimbabwe for those women that got land yeah. but they don't have resources to work on that land as women. And that's, that's my pledge to you. All right. Thank you all so much, leaders. And if you haven't signed the Mandela Pledge, you need to do so. It has been an inspiring time here, mapping the way forward for women's empowerment, leaving Mandela's legacy. And I urge us all to be the change that we seek. As Nelson Mandela once stated, that freedom cannot be achieved unless the women have been emancipated from all forms of oppression. I thank you very much for listening to us and being part of the conversation. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.